saying just a quick show of hands. How many of you fly on a regular basis? That's it. <laughs> yeah. And how many of you feel guilty about this? Okay, maybe after this presentation, uh, you will change your mind. <laughs> uh, so just a quick, you know, uh, factor literature review. Basically, aviation contributes about 3% of um, the overall greenhouse gas emissions around the world. Two thirds about it, international travel, international flights. I know that on a global level, it might seem pretty minor, the contribution of uh, flights to the overall greenhouse gas, you know, inventory. But it's a fast growing source. We're talking about roughly 5% yearly uh, growth due to tourism, VFR, some other activities that require rapid means of transport around the world um, through the year 2036. And unfortunately, greenhouse gas emissions from international flights are not regulated yet, which is a thing that is important to remember because the global solution is hopefully on the way by 2020, but it's not certain yet. Um, a few quick facts about airports in general. They can be as complex to manage as small cities. Um, the main players in each and every airport are, first of all, the airport authorities that can be seen as the city municipality for, you know, our issue. Um, airlines and third party providers that do all the other things, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the contribution of airports out of the whole um, aviation sector is about 5%. 95% of those emissions are carbon emissions, CO2. Um, and basically, even though, once again, it's a minor um, and small contribution, it's important um, and interesting to look at this issue because of the, inter uh, the technological interdependence, which means that if there were no um, airports, there were no flights and vice versa. Um, and also because of the local scale, um, countries like, let's say, the UK or Germany that have large hubs like you know, Heathrow or Frankfurt um, can generate emissions out of those airports that are equivalent to something which, let's say, a medium-sized city like Kingston, Ontario. So on the local level, it matters more, I guess. Um, so the research questions are, my first chapter, just like my supervisor Mili, uh, mentioned, um, understanding how airports uh, measure and monitor greenhouse gas emissions together with their tenants. Tenants means everything that is not the airport authority, what I mentioned before, airlines and third party providers. Um, and the second chapter is about, it's a survey, it's still ongoing, about uh, the major barriers for working with those tenants on carbon um, policies and talking about specific solutions for, you know, for carbon emissions, um, future versus current um, carbon policies, and where can areas of potential conflict be found with tenants? The method. Um, the first chapter um, is about um, a preliminary study that I've already done. I just took like the list of the first um, top busiest, 10 hundred busiest airports by passenger volume um, from around the world. And I was looking at their um, reports, greenhouse gas reports, if they published at all, um, tried to understand exactly how they measure, how they classify each and every source and try to basically analyze and, and understand what I can get out of it. Um, the second chapter is a mixed um, survey that is both qualitative and quantitative. I tried to send it to as many airports as I could around the world. It's a bit of a struggle because sometimes, you know, they are a little, a little bit reluctant to answer. Um, in collaboration with Airport Council International, uh, to figure out um, the barriers that I was mentioning previously. And in case I'll have some, you know, more, you know, issues that are gonna be left unresolved. I'll have to talk to consultants from the industry to understand exactly, you know, some specific um, areas. Um, the first chapter, just to give you an introduction about greenhouse gas methodology. Um, basically, the greenhouse gas protocol was written by uh, the WRI and WBCSD in 1998. It's the first um, document in the world that actually explains to you how you should um, report greenhouse gas emissions, how you should classify them. And based on this, you know, you can actually go and make more, you know, informed um, decisions about reductions and, and stuff like this. Um, scope one is basically everything that comes out directly from your organization. Um, scope two is about what you, about the electricity and the heat that you purchase. And scope three is about any other source of indirect emissions, such as waste disposal and um, employee and business travel. 
The thing is that each and every industry needs to have some sort of an adaptation of those standards to their specific needs because the greenhouse gas protocol is pretty general. So uh, for the airports, I could find actually um, two main documents that uh, try to do this sort of adaptations. First one was published in 2009, second one in 2010. Um, scope one would be, for the most part, um, everything that comes out of the airport authorities, fleet, generators, boilers, maintenance, um, things that they do. Scope two is pretty general for each and every industry. Once again, purchase electricity and heat. Scope three uh, for airports is specifically interesting because it entitles the most amount of opportunities for greenhouse gas reductions, including aircraft landing and takeoff um, cycles. This is the LTO thing that you see here. Ground support equipments, which are all the uh, little cars and, you know, and ground support pieces that you see on the ground. And also um, GAV refers to ground access vehicles, all the public and private vehicles that go from, I mean, between airports and city and other, you know, areas in their vicinity. I could find um, out that first of all, most of the uh, air traffic is concentrated in three, you know, um, major zones. The first one is Europe, the second one is North America, um, the third one is Asia Pacific, and a few more busier, you know, airports in Africa and Latin America and Middle East, but it's not the most, you know, significant amount. Um, and the biggest amount of reports published was actually in Europe, um, 17 out of the uh, 30 airports that uh, were included in the list of the 100 busiest. I was trying to understand why, and I, I figured out that there was a uh, an actual carbon accreditation program by ACI called ACA in brief that started there in 2009. And in order to be accepted to the program, you actually have to map your carbon emissions. So since it has been, you know, operating in this region for the most amount of time, I assume that, you know, there might be a connection between this because it serves as some sort of an incentive to do so. Um, regarding scope three specifically, where we have the most amount of problems, um, only 11 airports actually provided the breakdown of the scope three sources, which I mentioned before, APU, which is a part of, you know, the, the airplane in general, um, GSC, PCS, GEV, and, and landing and takeoff cycles, which is the most in, like, interesting one for me because, you know, airplanes and flights are pretty carbon intensive, you know, in terms of per capita emissions. Um, 19 airports based on, you know, this levels of certification, ACA and stuff, I, I could tell that they actually know the scope three emissions. Um, and I realized that based on, you know, this data, just like, you know, going with this hypothesis, there, there might be some problem of actually getting this, you know, information from the tenants and understanding the whole big picture of what's going on in, in airports in terms of, of emissions. Um, the, the other thing that I could figure out is that the ACA is like an aqua standard that is being diffused, basically started in Europe, um, and it is being diffused to other regions around the world, and it serves as a driver for them to keep on understanding, actually start understanding, you know, how they're doing in terms of, of carbon emissions. Now, uh, my supervisor, Melinda, and I were doing some uh, sort of a thinking process about um, where the landing and takeoff cycle um, should be located because for the most part, airports would either treat it as indirect emissions, pay attention, indirect emissions, or um, something that is totally separate from the airport, as if, you know, as if airlines and airports were like, had nothing to do with each other. Um, on average, we I found out that uh, LTO cycles uh, account for more than half of the airport, sorry, more than half of the emissions generated by an average airport. Uh, which is, you know, interesting, interesting to see. Um, and basically, um, the greenhouse gas protocol that I mentioned before says that if an organization controls or owns sources of emission, then it has to be included in their greenhouse gas inventory, preferably under scope one, which means that they are responsible for these emissions. By doing this, airports actually tell you, well, this is indirect emissions. I mean, we're not liable for this. Um, so we, I was doing a little bit of, you know, of an analysis if um, airports do control, you know, the, the source of emissions or, you know, if something else is going on there. And I found out that um, basically they have control over this because, first of all, aeronautical revenues, which means all the revenues that they get from, you know, the taxes, I mean, airlines, when they land or take off from an airport, they have to uh, pay some sort of a fee. 
basically it's still the major source for revenues, especially for small and regional airports. Um, in Europe, there are plenty of those because of the low cost you know, industry. Um, and basically airports do have control over you know, who they do business with, how many contracts they sign, uh, and the amounts of incoming and outcoming flights from you know, each and every airport. Another thing, interesting thing that I found are the standard operating uh, procedures, SOPs, such as single en engine um, taxing, which means that once an air airplane lands on the ground, they can basically shut one or two engines down and, and taxi like on the ground with one engine in order to save fuel and in order to reduce emissions. So basically on that you know, part of the LTO cycle when the airplane is on the ground, airports do have control. The third thing is the ATC. Basically ATC stands for air traffic control. Um, airplanes, when they fly between regions, um, they're basically uh, controlled by, uh, by the navigation providers such as Nav Canada here in Canada. But once they get in the vicinity of an airport and they get direction towards landing and stuff, they get guided by the ATC of the airport itself, which means that the airport takes control of what's going on you know, with this airplane once uh, because they have to fly somewhere. It's not that they just fly you know, from nowhere to nowhere. Uh, so uh, that's the idea. Uh, the conclusions from this chapter so far, this is the first one, uh, is that 19 airports do know, as I said before, the scope three. Um, the rest, not yet, which means that they, there might be some sort of a problem you know, getting this information from, uh, from tenants. That's what I'm trying to figure out in the second ch chapter. Um, there is an understanding in the professional community that in order to certify airport in a level that is more than the basic level, they have basically four levels of certification for ACA. First one, they have to um, map their own emissions, and then they have to set reduction targets, and then to get to the higher level, they actually have to get information from tenants and have some sort of a collaborative policy. Uh, so basically, the, commu sorry, the uh, professional community understands that in order to get from point A to point B, you actually, it's, it's a bit of a process and you actually have to figure out how to do it. It's not an easy thing that you can you know, just gather you know, data that is easily accessible. Um, and also the, the need for a unified standard that reflects um, the attribution and liability for greenhouse gas emissions in airports because right now it's kind of like a very flexible you know, uh, game. Each and every airport can basically decide if you want to you know, include scope three, not include scope three, what and which sources they want to include in scope three. And we basically don't really understand you know, the, the big picture. Um, chapter number two is actually a survey that is, is more um, micro than macro. I'm trying to understand exactly what's happening in airports and, and the relationships between airport authorities and um, tenants in regard in, you know, to that issue um, of carbon uh, policies. Uh, basically, it's really hard to convince airports to uh, answer the surveys because you know, it's, it's a public authority for the most part and, and these people are busy. So trying to get at least 30, I have 24 so far, sorry, 25, so uh, I'm optimistic. Um, the four pillar strategy basically is something that I'm trying to understand uh, through the survey. Airports, in order to reduce and manage carbon emissions can have either regulatory, technical, um, operational or economical or economic measures, sorry. Um, I'm gonna go more in details about it um, in the next slides. Um, through this, I'm trying to understand, as I mentioned before, the barriers for, you know, for an effective carbon policy in an airport. And the survey follows this structure of uh, the environmental management structure um, by, as, as defined by ISO. For the most part, you plan some sort of a policy, you do it, you check it, you monitor it, and then you correct or act. So far, I do have um, 25 results, as I mentioned before. It's an ongoing survey. I'm still waiting for, you know, for the final results. Um, I do have airports participating um, that have anywhere from a small number of tenants involved to up to 200 tenants, where you have a lot of airlines and a lot of you know, providers, and, and it's a big mess, sort of. Uh, in terms of passenger volume, anywhere between 125K to 63 passengers a year. The majority of them are in the United States, um, 16, five in Canada, and four in other regions of the world. Just to give you a sense uh, geographically and by governance structure, most of the airports that participate in my survey 
are in the United States and they're government owned and operated, even though I, I, I've seen some other models, some like such as independent not for profit, which is Canadian for the most part, you can see it's you know, located on the map. And even one airport that is private and for profit, so I'm expecting some other results you know, from them in Australia. Um, at first, I wanted to understand the priorities because airports in terms of environmental policies have other priorities other than um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so local air quality, aircraft noise, carbon emissions, and third party risks to communities that border airports are basically uh, the issues that I was looking at. I divided it into uh, the do stage and the plan stage. So that's basically what's going on right now. Um, as you can easily see, uh, basically, this works, yeah. So uh, for the first option, um, aircraft noise came up as um, you know, the most prominent one. Second option, um, local air quality, and then climate change came out as the third option. However, when we uh, actually look at what's going, what's, what's planned in the future, we see more number one and two um, in terms of carbon emissions than, than three and four like, like here. So the awareness is there, it's not there yet. That's what I, I wanted to say. And it was important for me to understand this because that, I mean, this, yeah. Basically, this is the distribution. They, they had to um, basically rank you know, their priorities for what's more important than, than what for them. So um, the highest priority that came up you know, for all the airports right now was aircraft noise, which was kind of um, surprising for me because I know that aircraft are 70% quieter than what they were you know, many years ago. So uh, this issue is, is, you know, is, is being mitigated. Um, but I wanted to kind of compare you know, what's, what's going on on the ground right now and what's planned in the future. Because some airports do not have the capabilities or you know, the personnel yet to deal with it. So I just wanted to know if they at least have plans. Yeah, exactly. The four major issues that you know, airports can deal with. Yeah, basically um, it came out more distinctive, you know, uh, regarding the do thing, but I think that, you know, regarding the plan, they, they had to think with themselves, you know, what's, what's more important than, than what in the future, which is, you know, a bit confusing, can be a bit confusing. Um, basically 80% of the airports that participated uh, so far did um, some sort of a greenhouse gas inventory or report and they actually know what's going on, which was important for me to know. Because if they know what's going on you know, in their airport, they can basically build on that. Um, it was interesting to see that uh, out of those 20%, um, the biggest group said that the biggest incentive for them to uh, actually come up with a carbon policy was because it was a part of an overall environmental strategy and they basically wanted you know, to, to do a good job in, in that sense. But out of those who didn't conduct this uh, report, they said that the biggest incentive for them would be mandatory regulation, which is kind of surprising in my opinion. Um, basically um, about GG emissions and how they are currently monitored. So the biggest group um, that came out was data plus approximation, which means that for their um, airport authorities, for their emissions, they could basically calcu calculate it quite easily, but for tenants, they actually had to approximate this um, because maybe, I don't know, they didn't have access or, or something, and then like one third didn't actually uh, do anything recently, and the other third could actually complete um, the entire thing together with the tenants. So I was also trying to understand how collaborative you know, those tenants are in terms of providing data. And uh, the biggest group uh, said that they were kind of neutral, you know, like undecided about this. Um, afterwards, um, the second group said that they were pretty collaborative. Small group, um, not at all. Small group, I mean, smaller group was uh, like really collaborative. That's pretty rare, I guess. And the other ones were to a small extent or, or not at all. You can basically see the, the segmentation here. I'm trying to understand it more in details by, by this um, course.
qualitative question, what would make your tenants to collaborative, um, to be more collaborative with the monitoring process, but I still have to code the answers for this one. I haven't done it yet. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, people in the environmental departments of each and every airport that participate. Okay, I, I was trying to understand specific things, you know, specific um, solutions for carbon emissions and, and understand in terms of technical, financial, and, and negotiations with tenants, where are the areas that, you know, require more attention? Um, in the due stage, most of the things came out as, as financial barriers, but it's interesting to see that in the plan stage, Okay, the plan stage, I actually had more things coming up as, as, as the first and the second you know, option in terms of um, negotiation with tenants, um, tracking GSC, which means that they need to understand where these you know, pieces of equipment are on the runway, and some people don't like to be monitored over time. Uh, so it was pretty obvious. Um, providing GSC with electric chargers, that's again, you know, if you want to encourage your um, your tenants to actually become more green and, and have electric vehicles instead of what they have right now and provide them with chargers. In that sense, I, I can understand because, you know, you kind of like enforce um, certain things and also buying green electricity. Um, I'll have to talk to consultants to get more clarification on this. Um, in terms of collaborative management and the management per se, I was, again, doing the same comparison and the thing that came up um, as you know, the most prominent thing was designated personnel to enforce and review emission standards. Most airports do have them right now. And the trend that I could see is that in the future, more, more and more airports are planning on having integrative sessions with tenants to kind of involve them more you know, in, in that carbon policy and, and this kind of thing, such as, I mean, what you see with green buildings and the charrette, it's, it's going there in, the, in that direction. Um, next, so basically coding uh, some more qualitative um, answers that I have to a few more questions to get more you know, clarifications about specific areas, um, consultants, um, and also a further analysis in terms of you know, statistics and, and everything once I get all the uh, answers to the survey. Um, in, before I, I finish, I'd like to, uh, to thank Airport Council International for helping me distributing the survey to, to many airports around the world. Um, IAE Canada and Vantage um, Airport Group, and once again, the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute in Seattle that helped me, you know, understanding this whole uh, greenhouse gas accounting thing. Thank you very much. Okay, Matt. So basically, I'm asking questions, the same questions regarding what's going on right now in airports and what they're planning to do in terms of um, policy. So I was trying to understand how incorporated this, you know, things, either providing financial incentives for replacing the GSC pieces, designated personnel to enforce and review emission standards, which means, you know, people on the ground that can, you know, do this kind of work and integrative sessions with tenants. If they were already part of, of uh, those airports, um, greenhouse gas policy. That question refers to what's going on right now, and I was asking the same exact question about you know, future plans. So I had a scale from one to five um, to understand like how incorporated these things are right now and in the future, you know, in, in terms of policies. One was not incorporated at all. Five was fully incorporated. Everything is on the ground. Um, and I was comparing uh, the means, statistically. So I got the highest one um, for designated personnel you know, in current policies, and I got a much higher one for um, integrative sessions with tenants, not the highest, but higher one, uh, which means that in the future, they're planning on having these things you know, incorporated in the policy. That's a good question, yeah. So basically, um, I saw like a recommended methodology on this one, which actually recommends um, 
distributing the emissions to both airlines and airports, uh, but each one has their own you know, portion. So the landing and takeoff is attributed to airports and all the rest, airlines. So you kind of like divide the responsibility, um, not evenly because of course, you know, we're talking about different proportions, but basically you, you involve everybody who should be involved in this. Yeah, which means indirect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Fifty-four is what's going on inside an airport, based on you know the data that I could find so far, and, and everything else, you know, flying from point A to point B, you have a lot of you know distance to go, and you know at least for uh, long haul flights, and ev everything else is going to be attributed to uh, airline sys. What's the situation in the flight industry? Is there any problem? It's a good question, but. That's, that's the interesting thing. I mean, landing and takeoff uh, in terms of like the phases of flight are, are the one that take up the most amount of fuel, I guess, because you actually have to, you know, take all this mess up and down. So uh, that's why it is important to, you know, to understand, the, you know, those proportions. That's a good question. I mean, for the most part, I guess that they would run away with, you know, security uh, <laughs> excuses. Um, I hope so. I basically have no idea about this, but I mean, for the most part, I mean, I, I see that, you know, civil airports are pretty reluctant, you know, to put out their data about these things. So uh, I don't want to think about military, you know. It's <laughs> Yes. So basically, um, the idea is to have some sort of a cup and trade mechanism for, you know, for the entire world. I mean, a thing like this is already um, on the ground in Europe and it has been there since 2012. They want to replicate this thing and put it on, on a global scale. So I guess that each and every country, based on the amount of air traffic will be allocated with, you know, with permits. Um, I think that it can be interested. I mean, interesting if they can involve airports, you know, in, in this like cup and trade thing, not just airlines, you know, based on, you know, what's going on in their, you know, territory and based on the air traffic coming and going uh, from them. So. That's basically the, the suggestions that, th that I've read so far. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, so